from family to family. Chapter 2, part 9.1, On the way home, read by Natalia Buzova. There were initially up to 100 young men and women in the transit camp. It was them who closely watched our barn and brought the British soldiers to it. Then the contingent of the camp began to grow, including the people from captivity. We were sponsored by a British military unit. Twice a day, a marching kitchen came from there. We were given bread, various brews and cigarettes. In addition, we went to the surrounding villages for lard and eggs, and in every yard they gave us something. So we ate well. We slept on iron beds with mattresses, pillows and blankets, I don't know where they came from. Before us, the military obviously had lived in those houses. Gradually, the camp took on more organized forms. All its workforce was divided into companies and platoons. They were led mainly by former Red Army commanders from among the prisoners. Former pilot Captain Bacharov became the head of the camp. He was said to be a hero of the Soviet Union. A strict agenda was established. The commanders on duty made sure that no one left the camp, as there were cases of robbery of the residents of the surrounding villages, especially at night. Various representatives of emigrant organizations frequented us. They agitated not to return home because there, they said, prisons and camps were waiting for us. We were offered travel and employment in Canada, Australia, the United States, and other countries, but we did not believe them. We met and saw them off with indignation, but some of us were taken with them, apparently former police officers, Vlasovites, and former repressed people. Representatives of the Soviet military mission arrived in gold uniforms. I had never seen before. They were greeted with great joy and elation. They delivered patriotic speeches and promised to return us to our homeland soon, which, according to them, was waiting for us. After them, an organized order began in our country, and their representative in civilian clothes, a representative of the special department, remained in the camp. He began to conduct questionnaires and personal interviews with everyone, as if for the purpose of who to, where, and how to go home. In fact, it was the first check of who was who, because there were a lot of suspicious questions in the questionnaires, and they were too detailed. I spent a month in the camp and led an athletic lifestyle. I was primarily engaged in restoring my health. I ate well, ran, I exercised several times a day, bathed and sunbathed. In the evenings, young people danced and sang. We, a group of former prisoners, simply avoided them, considered them untimely. I literally had a patriotic spirit. I was preparing for a meeting with the motherland. Even the hope of returning to school was burning. I had been severely wounded following the orders of the headmaster and considered myself not only clean, but also worthy of some encouragement. I thought I would report on the feet of our platoon and maybe I would be left at the school or sent to the army as a platoon commander. But the hill was so deformed that I had to either be decommissioned or sent to a surgeon to fix it. Only later did I realize that no one needed me with the brand of a prisoner. And then, holy naivety. When about 600 repatriates were gathered, the British and representatives of our military mission began to prepare us to be sent to the Soviet zone of occupation of Germany. Everyone was given a dry ration for two days, and the former prisoners of war were given a full English uniform, boots, trousers, a jacket, and a hat. We were taken to the train by lorries. A brass band played, and everyone was in high spirits. Some of the civilian boys and girls had had time to get married, and then they were carrying large suitcases and various junk. 
Nobody checked what you were carrying and how much. And there had been a place to take it. The city had houses and separate apartments without owners. And our Ivans quickly got there, collecting clothes, shoes, souvenirs. And we, the captives, did not rush to that and took with us only our saved souls and the bright joy of liberation. Everything in me sang and rang like spring streams in the sun. I do not remember exactly where we crossed the line that became the new border between West and East. But the first meeting at the border with those who embodied the formidable Stalin barrier system was forever etched in my memory. Our soldiers of the internal troops were standing along the echelon with machine guns in their hands, exactly as the Germans received us at the Slavuta Gross Hospital, only without dogs. Where was such distrust from, suspicion, and such rudeness towards one's own people who had suffered because of their own state gang? Stalin hated and feared both civilian repatriates and prisoners of war because the first would tell the truth about the standard of living in our country and abroad. German workers and peasants lived much better than our builders of socialism. And the prisoners of war would tell about the real reasons for the defeat on the front in the first period of the war. In both cases, the main blame was on him and his entire tyrannical system, which was based on adventurous projects, fear and blood. Therefore, he tried to isolate such unwanted witnesses, if not to kill them, at least to isolate them securely. Most of the generals and officers who returned from captivity were shot or thrown into prisons and camps for long periods and he kept the privates under the supervision of the MK KVD in the grassroots worker staff and in the collective farm reserves. The echelon was unloaded. Everyone was driven to a deserted place and announced that they would have to hand over weapons, literature, gramophone records, as well as gold items and money. The suitcases got lighter for some. Then the search began, brutal and angry. They mostly searched for precious things. Uh, after that, we were lined up in a column and taken to the camp. We walked five kilometers. There was heat and some, exhausted, were already throwing out winter coats, blankets, carpets, and other heavy items. Lorries drove behind and picked everything up. The pedestrian crossing must have been arranged that way for that purpose. The British had taken us to the train with a brass band, and our army treated us like criminals. That was how our, and obviously not our motherland, waited and met its sons and daughters. Tsar Nicholas II awarded the St. George's Cross to those who risked their lives to escape from captivity. And Stalin feared and hated them. Therefore, they were sent to prisons and forested places in the taiga. You can mention the hero of the Soviet Union, Captain Devetayev, who with several fellow pilots had hijacked a German plane at the airport and escaped from captivity. Stalin satraps threw them into prison, where they spent 10 years each. Almost all the heroes of Brest, including their commander Gavrilov, were searched for in the barrier camps after Stalin's death. The camp immediately separated men from women and commanders from privates. The head of the camp was a skinny captain, angry and abusive, with a feverish gleam in his eye. He walked with a stick and limped, apparently after being injured. He saw in every repatriate an enemy of the people. He especially clung to those who were better dressed in bourgeois rags. It came out of him at every moment. I fought and you somehow helped Hitler. 
each of us was summoned several times for questioning to the smash death of spies workforce unit i wrote my autobiography twice there after which i was interrogated for another hour or two my case was handled by a senior lieutenant three four weeks later he called and said will you serve in the army i gladly agreed as I wanted to return home, not from captivity, but from the army in military uniform. Together with a group of civilian boys, I was sent to the 32nd Artillery Division of the 1st Belarusian Front. Apparently from the school and maybe from Petigorsk, I received some confirmation of participation in the fighting, injuries and hospital stay, because those who were captured healthy were sent to work in echelons. It was only many years later that I learned of their hard fate. They were sent to the taiga for logging, to mines and new building constructions and some simply to imprisonment. I first got to the training team with civilian newcomers, but the commanders immediately noticed that I was already well trained and after talking to me, they sent me as a telephone operator to the 810th separate reconnaissance division, which had only veterans. They treated me normally, especially after seeing my injured leg and a scar on my back in the bus. I didn't have time to get used to it there, as I was called to the personnel department. The procedure was repeated with writing an autobiography and subsequent interrogation. Apparently, my file had already come there from the camp. By all indications, it followed me all my life. From the army to the Lochwitzer Regional Department of the KGB of the Poltava region, then to the Kivertsi District Department of the KGB of the Volyn region, I don't know where it is now, but it is somewhere because the system that gave birth to it is still alive.